right. The next guest we have is Sean Sherman, who is the sous chef. Sean, I'm, I must be honest with you. I had never heard of you, but apparently you're very famous. And a lot of people um, that uh, heard about our conference, they heard your name, they heard about your organization, and they were really, really excited. So thank you for joining us. Thanks a lot. I'm happy to be here. Um, so yeah, so I guess my time frame is going to about four, right? Just given my presentation. Yeah, yeah. If it's if you if it's you alone presenting, yes, you have the full hour. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. So I'm going to jump into it. I've been doing this presentation for quite a few years now. Um, I my name is Sean Sherman. I am based in Minneapolis. I am uh, I was born and raised on Pine Ridge Reservation. I'm enrolled with the Oglala Lakota Sioux Tribe, and uh, we have quite a few businesses going on here in Minnesota. Um, I formed my company called the Sioux Chef, which is over here, the sous chef. Anyways, um, S I O U X, just to play on words. And uh, under the sous chef, we have a restaurant that we opened up this last year called Owamni. And Owamni is the name of where we are. It's the we are right on the Mississippi River, right downtown Minneapolis, um, which uh, the these beautiful waterfalls that used to be there um, as colonizers came in, they called it um, Saint Anthony Falls. But the true name for the Dakota people that lived there was Owamni Omni, which meant place of the falling swirling water and it's just a really cool space and i'll talk a little bit about that project but we also have our nonprofit called natives or north american traditional indigenous food systems and under natives we have indigenous food lab um, which is kind of our nonprofit kitchen that we do a lot of work which i'll also talk about um, i am going to just jump into my powerpoint here so give me two seconds get this together <clears throat> Okay. So anyways, um, I have been in Minneapolis for quite a few years. I've been a chef most of my life. I've been in the food world um, pretty much most of my life too. My mom moved us off the reservation when I uh, was just before I started high school and I started working in restaurants when I was 13 years old and I started just uh, doing that um, out, of, out of necessity mostly. Um, so, uh, when I was, when my mom moved us off the reservation, like a lot of families coming off the res, we didn't have a lot of money. So I just got the first job I could get, um, which was in a restaurant. So 13 years old working in a restaurant and just did that all through high school and college. And, um, after college moved to Minneapolis and continued to work in restaurants, um, and just worked my way into a chef position at a pretty young age. I was about 27 years old around the year 2000 and worked for a few different restaurants around Minneapolis doing all sorts of different kinds of styles, work for Spanish restaurants, French restaurants, Japanese restaurants, um, and all sorts of things. And had a pretty good career, started off with that. But a few years into my chef career, I had the epiphany to do what I'm doing today, um, which is really just uh, a focus on native foods because um, I got to a point where I realized there was just a complete absence of indigenous out there, especially in the culinary world. There was no native restaurants. There were barely any cookbooks on the whole situation. And I just really wanted to understand like what were my ancestors eating? You know, how were they storing foods and where were they, um, you know, which, what was their knowledge of plants and all sorts of questions I had. Um, and, you know, one of my, one of my jobs at a, at a young age, right out of high school, I worked for the U.S. Forest Service and I was a field surveyor. So I had to learn the names of all the plants in the northern black hills and that um that focus really kind of helped frame a lot of this work of just realizing that there's just so much plant life out there that um, is just completely underutilized and that my uh, dark lakota ancestors would have had a really good education around those so that's kind of where i started when i started researching this um so anyways on Really, you know, our focus is on Native American indigenous foods. Uh, we primarily look at uh, North America, so um, basically Mexico all the way through Alaska. Um, but we also see indigenous foods as a global situation because there's indigenous peoples across the globe um, who have equally been affected by colonialism um, in various degrees. Um, and, you know, colonialism is obviously still very much alive out there. So when I got into this work and really focused on indigenous foods, um, it really became a study in history because you know, no matter where we are in North America, you know, we're standing on indigenous land space and all of North America's history begins with indigenous history, yet it's been so invisible um, for so long. And it's really damaging, of course, um, for us. And, you know, they just, uh, you know, so 
we really focus on, we focused on like what are pre-colonial foods, you know, for our restaurant example, for example, in Minneapolis, like we cut out colonial ingredients. So we don't have any dairy, any wheat flour, any cane sugar. We don't use beef, pork, or chicken. We use a lot of wild game, a lot of wild foods, a lot of heirloom varietals of corns and beans and squash and chilies and sunflower seeds and so forth. Um, and just really focus on what is region, what are regional indigenous foods and what are modern indigenous foods, you know. But I also started doing a lot of these talks to explain the work that we do and we realized there was a lot of questions out there so and people didn't even really understand what the term pre-colonial meant so i always like to start off with just you know breaking it down from the very beginning just to make sure that we're all on the same page um, and just breaking down what does colonialism mean so colonialism is just the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country occupying the settlers and exploiting it economically which obviously is not unique to um, where we are but has actually happened all across the globe um, especially stemming out stemming out of European powers um, and it's affected everywhere North America South America Africa India the Middle East Southeast Asia Australia New Zealand Hawaii and it's really important to understand like how valuable indigenous knowledge is uh, when it comes to just living closer to the regions that we're in and the thousands of years and millennia of traditions that were handed down to be able to do that because indigenous peoples around the globe um, had at one point the key to live sustainably utilizing primarily plant knowledge when it comes down to it and it's just so much that we could be learning and for us where we are in the united states like our history it's not that old you know because like we're a very young country. We don't have that much history, but um, the indigenous peoples who have been here for millennia obviously have a ton of history to share. Um, and that's part of the work that we do is trying to understand that and share that knowledge base through food. So, you know, we see, um, we have to, you know, break it down to understand where all this starts, which, you know, manifest destiny. Um, and, you know, some of these terms that European colonizers utilize kind of give themselves the ability to be okay with taking over so much indigenous space. Um, and, you know, it just creates centuries of racism and white supremacy that's still actively um, alive today. Um, and a lot of our systems are still built and centered around uh, around a lot of this, this notion. Um, we just have to remember that, you know, during the slave trade, um, you know, where 12 and a half million people are brought over from Africa as enslaved indigenous peoples of Africa into these regions that during that same time period, there was over five and a half million indigenous peoples here in also during that slave trade. Um, and it's something that people don't talk about, but it's, you know, it's a big part of the story. Um, and it's very active, you know, there was still slavery happening in many countries and still happening in many countries um, into today's world. Um, but we have to remember like how, again, like how little history we have here in the United States because you know if you look at the what is the United States in the year 1800 which is not ancient history you know the we're literally not much more than the 13 colonies you know with a few more at that point but the western uh, you know frontier is basically Hawaii uh, sorry Hawaii. the western frontier is basically Ohio at this point in time in history and the reality of what's going on out there is that even despite European powers dividing up this huge land space and making giant claims of ownership and the reality the indigenous peoples of this land space have are still stewarding these land spaces as they always have been and, and a lot of indigenous communities haven't even set eyes on on european people um, during this time period um, so it, within this one century that's the one century i really like to pinpoint it's 1800 to 1900 because it's so damaging to um, us as indigenous peoples and so much goes down within that single century um, and we don't even really define what we have today with what is the US and Mexico and situations like that until the middle of the 1800 after the Treaty of Guadalupe in 1848 um, or, or 1845, sorry. And, um, but, you know, people just, again, like we don't have that much history, you know, because we just have to think about like during this one century, this one single century, like how much trauma happened to indigenous peoples in such a very short time period. I think about my great grandfather, who would have been the last in my um, line of generation and family to retain 100% of Lakota knowledge base and an education, because um, he's born in the late uh, 1850s, early 1860s. Um, he's 17 during the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876, and then he grows up to to see um, everybody get pushed onto the Pine Ridge Reservation as a Lakota person. Um, he sees his kids have to go through boarding school situations. He's there to witness the Wounded Knee Massacre. 
Um, and he eventually sees some of his children grow up and fight for the U.S. government. And I feel like that's just so much to happen in such a short period of time. And myself, like I was born in 1974. So a hundred years prior to my birth, my Lakota ancestors were still living with 100% of their indigenous uh, knowledge base because they don't even discover gold in the Black Hills until 1876. And then things go south fast. But at the beginning of that century, um, you know, over 80% of what is the U.S. was under indigenous control. And by the end of that century, less than 2% only because of the reservation systems that were formed. So again, we have to remember like how much recent trauma we went through um, as indigenous peoples and how focused the United States government was with things like the Indian Removal Act of 1830, the Indian Appropriation Act of 1871, the Dawes Act of 1887, um, the Homestead Act of 1862. All of these pieces, um, just you, the United States government doing what they can to strip um, power and land space away from indigenous peoples because the United States government early on discovers that once it's able to take indigenous land space it can commodify it and break it up into parcels and sell it and the United States makes an intense amount of money um, selling all of this and stolen indigenous land space at the same time utilizing a lot of stolen indigenous peoples from Africa to help build a lot of the resources that are still out there today. Um, so we see a loss of indigenous food access very early on um, as we kind of go through this situation and an extreme environmental destruction too because like our whole land space changes so once the colonizers come in then we see la massive lumbering operations and you know just so much old growth for is just being completely wiped down in areas like Minnesota, Wisconsin, and so forth, and all the way out to the Pacific Northwest. Um, and then it's just really intense. And you can't even imagine like what just miles and miles and miles of old growth forest would look like, but that's what we had um, during those time periods. And that's completely gone now. It's completely changed. Because even when I was working for the Forest Service, like the oldest tree I'd found in the Black Hills was about 90 years old at the very oldest. Most of them were around 60, 70 year, years old. Um, and we just, we have no idea like how much we lost when it comes to seeds and, the, and just the, the destruction of all these ind um, indigenous farmlands that were out there across North America. Um, our first president, George Washington, one of the first things that he does was to send General Sullivan out in 1779 um, to basically wipe out the indigenous population in that northeastern part of the United States um, and calls for the total destruction and devastation of their settlements um, completely. So General Sullivan sets out to do that in, in, in that time period, and over that single summer, he accomplishes just that. Um, and there's written documents of, uh, of what happens during an eyewitness accounts of this march that happens during that summer. Um, and, you know, they're, they're talking about just completely burning down and, and wiping out, you know, just in such immense farming and agriculture, like six mile by six mile crops growing, um, and just, you know, so much intense agriculture happening. And again, like we have no idea. So the natives get pushed basically into Canada during that time period. And the Haudenosaunee word for U.S. president today still means town destroyer um, because of that situation. Um, and we see this, this kind of sets the tone for the rest of what is the United, United States actions against indigenous peoples. So this is a flyer um, from uh, the, right before the Sand Creek Massacre, massacre in, in Denver, Colorado. Um, and the, these kinds of things happen uh, across, you know, mostly in the middle of like the 1860s, mostly and into the 1870s. But we just see a lot of the very exact situation happening um, of this aggressiveness towards indigenous peoples and just complete racism. Because we see things like the Marias Massacre in 1870 in Montana. Um, here in Minnesota, where I'm at, we had the Dakota uprising after the Dakota people kept just getting screwed out of everything. And, you know, there was just really harsh punishments um, and, you know, they're eventually when they did uprise, the United States government eventually does defeat them. Uh, most of them flee into the West and a lot of them are rounded up and um, put into a concentration camp right outside of Minneapolis and Fort Snelling. Um, and then eventually they're all put onto river boats and then shipped down to where, shipped down the Mississippi to where the Missouri River meets and then shipped up the Missouri River into what is now South Dakota and then dropped off at a certain point and then trained into the Crow Creek Reservation, which is where um, some of my great grandparents are, are born and raised from this exact situation and over 600 people perish on that one boat ride alone um, because of the harsh um, 
just situations. And during the 1863, they actually passed the Dakota Expulsion Act and the Winnebago Ho-Chunk Expulsion Act in Minnesota, making it illegal to be Dakota or Winnebago Ho-Chunk during those time periods. Um, and there was a bounty system out there where people could make upwards to $200 for the body part of an indigenous person um, during these time periods. And if you do the inflation rate of what is $200, it's an immense amount of money. Um, and the same things happen in, in states like, uh, well, California is a really great example too, where they also had a very active bounty system where the California, newly formed state of California spent millions of dollars during that time period. And again, if you look at the inflation rates of what that equals to, it's pretty astounding. And especially that the United States or California pays that out and the United States government pays back California for this, for this genocide. Um, and then we just see so much a loss of things like the bison in the West, of course. Um, again, you can find a lot of writings across uh, Congress of what to do with indigenous peoples in the West. Um, and, you know, the United States government came to the conclusion that if they took out the bison, which so many tribes were utilizing, um, that it would make them easier to subdue, which it basically did. And there's quite a few, the, you know, the United States government spends uh, quite a few summers just taking out um, bison intentionally and paying hunting parties to do that. Um, so at the beginning of the 1860s, they do a count uh, to try to figure out how many bison are out there and it's in the hundreds of millions. Um, and it's almost wiped out to extinction within a, just a couple of decades. Um, and <clears throat> again, like this, this very focused, uh, you know, environmental change and destruction of indigenous uh, foodways, you know, is very well documented across the U.S. government in a lot of the archives there. Um, and it's just a really, again, super intense and changing time period. Like the, as Lakota, we grew up with stories of, of when the bison disappears um, and, you know, reason, trying to understand reasons why that was happening. But as indigenous peoples, the most damaging thing that happens to us is the eradication of our own education. So if you take a moment to identify what is indigenous education. It's just the thousands of generations of knowledge that was handed down to us, um, family after family after family, giving us, again, the blueprint to live sustainably, utilizing primarily plant knowledge when it comes down to it. So there's just this immense amount of education that we should be learning. But instead, during the turn of that end of that century, we go through these really intense assimilation effort years. So my grandparents era, born in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there sh they should have been downloading the all of that indigenous education, those thousands of generations of knowledge of how to be indigenous peoples from all the diverse tribes that are out there. But instead, they're put into boarding school situations like Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania, um, where they're forced to, you know, cut their hair, to learn English, to learn Christianity. Um, and it's a military school, and it's very, uh, very harsh. And a lot of, a lot of children die there completely. Um, and it's just, again, like just, you know, another form of genocide that happens to us as indigenous peoples that's very well documented and continues all the way through my you, you know like the it continues on because they they were thinking they could just take these indigenous children and civilize them but instead they're just handing down generations of trauma because these kids are subjected to all sorts of physical abuse mental abuse sexual abuse um, and we still see that in today's uh, indigenous communities and you can trace that trauma right back to this very era. Um, you see boarding schools pop up all over the United States. Um, you see them pop up as residential schools all across Canada. Um, and, you know, there's just so much, so much that happens to us um, during this time period um, that needs to be talked about. And I know that there's a lot of talk in Canada because people have been scouring the grounds and finding Indigenous bodies and unmarked graves everywhere and um, really starting to take steps towards reparations, but there's still a long ways to go. Um, the United States government has not even started that right now. Um, and there was just such harsh punishments when I visited Carlisle Indian School that I was told that if the kids were caught speaking their language or singing it in their languages, that they would face punishments like isolation or brushing their teeth with pumice stones for minutes at a time. Um, and again, these are just kids. So I'd found uh, this in Ontario a few, a couple of years ago, right before pandemic, where they did, um, where they did a, uh, just an honoring where they found the names of all these indigenous children that had passed away and wrote them down and did an honoring. So I always think it's really powerful just to watch this banner and to watch how many names are on this banner.
And now we know that that's actually just an extremely partial list because they're finding, they're finding thousands of bodies um, and they've only searched just a handful of schools so far up in Canada. And again, haven't even touched what happened in the United States um, at the boarding school situation. So then, you know, after that really intense year of genocide during the 18 to 1900s, you know, what happens in the 1900s to 2000 century, like, you know, we still have to go through a lot. And like we were, my grandparents are born before they're citizens, which doesn't happen until 1924. Um, we go through a really intense era from the 1940s to 1960s of Indian termination and relocation policies. Um, so cities like Minneapolis, Chicago, Oakland, Denver um, are hubs, and they, we build a lot of infrastructure for indigenous communities. But again, the United States was extremely racist during those time periods, and it was very hard for indigenous peoples to find work, and it really just created segregated communities um, within the cities um, and an urban population um, that, of struggling indigenous communities that we still have today. Um, we also go through a really intense Indian adoption area of 1941 to 1967, which I don't know why people don't talk about more because it's really intense. So during this, during this period, 1941 to 1967, one out of three Native children are separated from their families and put up into adoption. Um, and that's not a small number, like one out of three people, um, that should be I mean, that's just, it's so insane. Uh, we can't vote uh, as like a, a lot of uh, many other people of color until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and where I grew up in Pine Ridge on South Dakota, the South Dakota government wouldn't even allow votes on in unorganized counties until the 1980s, which meant uh, the native counties around South Dakota. We can't even celebrate our religions until the Religious Freedom Act of 1978, um, which is well within my lifetime. So growing up in post-colonial Native America, America, which we really haven't, you know, how is it going for us? You know, not so great, you know, because this just happens during the last presidential election where they call uh, CNN forgets how to even name indigenous peoples and just calls all indigenous peoples something else. Um, and, you know, and as far as food goes, you know, like I grew up uh, with the commodity food program as did a lot of families and still, a lot of families are still surviving off the commodity food program and the FDPIR. And it's really unfortunate that this body of food has been really damaging to us as indigenous peoples because it's far from our traditional food diet. Um, and, you know, this food is, you know, it's just high in, in cholesterol, high in saturated fats, high in carbs, high in sugars, high in salts. And it's just a lot of super over processed food that's not good for us. And we have a lot of data now to show exactly what happens to entire groups of people as their, as this is their main source of nutrition. Um, and when I was growing up, we didn't have the fancy cans. We just had things with beef with juices or pork with juices, you know, and it's just the with juices that really sells it to us. Um, and Indian tacos, you know, like people like to celebrate native food. And this is what a lot of people will think of as fried bread tacos, Navajo tacos, Indian tacos, whatever you want to call it. But when you take the time to start to decolonize some of these food ways, like you don't, you know, there's not much here that is native, you know, because you don't have beef, you don't have fried bread, you would have beans, you could have some tomatoes. You definitely don't have those weird California black olives. I don't even know where those come from. You don't have cheese, you don't have dairy, um, you know, but you would have maybe some onions and some beans and some tomatoes and some spices, you know, so, but there's, there's a lot of work we can do. And that's the work that we try and showcase and focus and share is understanding indigenous food systems today, because food is such a powerful language, you know, um, food is such a cultural um, identifier for us as humans in general. And for indigenous peoples, especially, well, I wouldn't say especially, but here in North America, we lost a lot of our indigeneity um, because we lost a lot of our food. And I feel like there's a really clear path of how to get that back if we had more understanding. So one way is to look at um, the diversity of indigenous foods is just understanding like what does North America look like because we have such intense um, and diverse ecosystems all across the place. Um, there's deserts and mountains and coastal regions and Arctic and tropic and everything in between and all sorts of different kinds of plants and climates and animals and things throughout that. And then when you layer indigenous peoples on top of that, you can start to see how indigenous diversity begins to look because um, one way to do it is just looking at language maps. So if you look at language maps of North America, you can see an intense amount of diversity and knowing that these are also very um, generalized that within those huge color blocks, there's all sorts of sub dialects and other groups in there. Um, and there's just so much diversity, but we just have this vision of being able to drive a 
you know, drive across this nation in any direction, stopping at indigenous run food businesses and really experience that diversity. Cause every few hundred miles, you're going to be in a different religion, different language, different mythology, different foods, different everything. And we should be really celebrating all of that diversity. Cause right now, if you drive across the U S everything is going to taste the same. Every menu is going to look the same. All the burgers are going to taste the same. Even all this craft beer tastes exactly the same, you know? So like, there's just, everything's so homogenized and we don't even realize it most of the time. So there's just so much that we could be showcasing because there's a lot of indigenous peoples out there. There's 634 tribes in Canada, 576 in the U.S., and 20% of Mexico identifies as indigenous, which is a huge population. And about 8% of that population still speaks indigenous languages over Spanish or French. And if you compare colonial settler states to indigenous territories, there's just no comparison because it, you know, it doesn't matter for us who's speaking English or Spanish or French. Those are all European colonial languages. Um, you know, we should really be focused on the indigenous backbone and foundation of what is North America, which is, which it's the indigenous diversity, you know? Um, so our focus is really trying to understand indigenous education and bring that back. Um, and, you know, how do we take steps to do that? So when we're looking at indigenous knowledge bases, it's not just about cooking. It's not just about understanding what are, what are modern native foods, but it's looking at how we're civilization surviving, you know, how are indigenous food systems working? What are the commonalities of indigenous food systems? systems and indigenous communities out there pre-colonial and how can we work towards recovering and reclaiming a lot of our ancestral foodways um, moving forwards so we study all of those pieces wild foods permaculture agriculture seed saving seasonal lifestyles ethnoceanography hunting fishing whole animal butchery mycology salt sugar, salt sugar fat productions crafting land stewardship cooking techniques um, indigenous metallurgy indigenous histories traditional medicines food preservation fermentation nutrition health spirituality gender roles sustainability there's just so much you know so one we break it down into pieces like proteins are super easy to understand because we all grow up in school learning that Native Americans used every part of the bison. Um, but, but that's really just a study. Um, that's really just a study and how resourceful that we had to be as indigenous peoples because we didn't have the we didn't have the privilege to be wasteful like we do in today's society. And we had to be resourceful. And we weren't doing that with just the bison, but with everything, with any animal, with any plant, and understanding because of thousands of years of, of knowledge being handed down what to do with all these bison products and how to utilize everything and find a purpose for everything um, and that's something that we can get back towards um, right away so people should not be afraid of proteins if the, if the animal isn't a pig a chicken or a cow because those animals didn't even exist on this continent not that long ago and there's just so much protein diversity out there of all sorts of stuff that we could be utilizing, whether you're on the coastal regions or inland or different games or even insect usage. You know, we have crickets on our menu at Awamni in Minneapolis, and I'm probably selling about 15 pounds of crickets a week, which is a ton of crickets because they don't weigh very much and people are up open to trying them, you know, and, and insect protein was normal in so many different regions across North America and still is in many areas around the world. But our biggest piece to uh, reconnecting with our ancestral knowledge is the understanding of plants, because that's something special and unique that our indigenous ancestors had by living in certain places for generations and generations and generations was knowing what to do with all the plants around us, you know, so not even having a word for something called weed, you just have, you know, you start to learn the names of all the plants individually, you know what their purpose is, is it food, is it, mess, mess, is it medicine, can you craft with it, and typically the plants offer all of those pieces, you know, so when you open up your eyes, stop calling everything a weed and look around, you're going to start to see nothing but food and medicine around you everywhere, and the western diet has done very little to really connect with how much amazing biodiversity that we have here in North America. Um, and the study of ethnobotany is just so interesting. I just, you know, love being outdoors. I love discovering new plants and utilizing them and learning how my ancestors utilize them um, and trying to, you know, make that just a daily part of our lives, you know, um, understanding what kind of carbohydrates were people utilizing, like this picture of Timpsala, which is a prairie turnip, which is something that we harvested growing up on Pine Ridge and a lot of families still do. And going through 
through the process of dehydrating and braiding these pieces just like that or play things like the camas root in northern california and the pacific northwest and the great basin region um, where i'm at in minnesota we have the true wild rice which is so unique and so special because it only grows on these lakes so if you've only had black wild rice from the grocery store and have never experienced true hand harvested rice from the tribes here in the minnesota wisconsin region um, you have to just seek it out because it's so different you know um, or just that knowledge of plant water plants in general because coastal coastal communities again had all this vast knowledge to know which which plants to collect and when to collect them and how to harvest them and what they're good for um, and there's just so much that we can be learning or if you're in desert regions where all the food and all the plants look like they want to hurt you or maim you you know indigenous peoples got along very well with the plants around them and it's almost silly to use the term food desert because indigenous communities in the desert saw nothing but food around them all the time you just have to learn you know how to identify it um, agriculture is a huge part of our study also because we believe that we are at the pinnacle of modern day agriculture, but we actually are doing more damage than, than we should be doing, which I think is pretty obvious for a lot of people who study agriculture and, and just the industrialization of agriculture in today's world because we know how, much, how many chemicals are being utilized um, to keep up the style of agriculture and how dangerous these chemicals um, are um, and that you know they're getting into the soil, they're getting into our waterways are getting into our communities into our towns are getting into our houses and they're getting into our bodies and it's you know it's hard to get a steer away from any of this food that's you that's grown in this manner like you basically have to stay away from the entire center part of your grocery store because everything it's the corns the soybeans like the sugar and all the stuff there's just like so much out there and you know if you see titles like how worried should we be that glyphosate was found in our cheerios like we should be very very worried because that stuff is not you know so dangerous you know and we have no idea what absorbing micro doses of this stuff is going to do to us because we're basically just a bunch of lab rats when it comes down to it but we're going to find out in very few decades of what happened but if you look at indigenous agriculture looking back into some of the past civilizations like the mayan um, who are there's still you know over a million mayan speakers in the yucatan alone and just how much amazing progress they made in science and architecture and agriculture you know and, and if you've ever been down to the to the mayan peninsula in the yucatan like they didn't even have open water like everything was in the cenotes and they still are able to massively grow agriculture out um, they're growing corns and beans and squash and chili peppers and sunflower seeds and you see the same thing in what is today Mexico City and where they had these raised beds and these milk where they're growing the same this exact same things with the corns and beans and squash and sunflower and cotton tobacco chili peppers and you can just trace it northward like corn culture shoots both north and south into the Americas but you can follow you know some of the seed varietals as you move upwards and northward so this is a Zuni farm where they figured out how to farm in the middle of the desert using more of what we call a waffle system but just being able to grow um, group, groupings of these same plants, so these corns and beans and squash and chilies and so forth. And a lot of people might know about the Three Sisters mound systems, which is a very particular East Coast style of growing the corn and the beans and squash directly together because the corn will grow, the beans will crawl up the corn and the squash will cover the ground around it. It becomes a very symbiotic growing situation. But again, this is a very um, specifically East Coast style of farming. Um, here in the Midwest where I'm at, because agriculture crawled way up here to Minnesota because of the Mississippi and uh, Missouri River Valleys. And, you know, this is Buffalo Bird Woman. There's a really cool book out there called Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden that chronicles her memories of being a Hadatsa woman in what is today modern is today North Dakota, and she's using a row system, you know, but the book chronicles her memories of how she grew up in a Hadatsa farmer um, and the tools that she uses, like she's using this buffalo shoulder bone hoe in that photo and deer antler rakes, and she's making more of a row system. So there's the same kinds of things that they're growing way down in Mexico with the corns and the beans and squash and the sunflowers. There's no chili peppers as far north, but, you know, it's still really cool. And it's such a cool book because it's a really great look on indigenous focused perspective perspective of agriculture and it's so rare because it's coming from a female perspective which they which we just never get in history you know let alone from an indigenous female voice 
but we have to really understand like how important these seeds are and that each one of these seeds comes from very particular regions, very particular people. And we just really have to do everything we can to help save these seeds and to keep these seeds in the hands of indigenous peoples um, um, so that we can continue this heritage, you know, because it's a part of us, especially for those of us who grew up within corn culture communities um, that we have to re reclaim and, re and maintain um, just growing out these amazing seeds and this amazing diversity of things that are out there, um, you know, and just showcasing like what we can do with that. And that's what we do with the restaurant. So like, what do we do at the restaurant um, and our food groups and our nonprofit of just focusing on how do we use indigenous knowledge in today's world? And how do we pay homage to our ancestors in ways that are really meaningful and respectful um, and maintaining a lot of the health that was there with us? Because we live in a modern day age, you know, and part of the work that we did was just using our team to be outdoors, to identify plants and to use technology to do so and to connect with the world around us. And, you know, again, just like see nothing but plants in the seasons that come through. Like we're walking right into ramp season right now. We just finished, uh, we, we're still sap tapping some trees. We've been tapping maple and birch and black walnut, and box elder, um, and just cooking all that down in our kitchens. Um, but we're, you know, just so ready for spring. We're so ready for this food season to start. And there's just so much, because again, if you open up your eyes and look around, you're going to see nothing but food all around us. And, you know, using ourselves as role models of what do you do with this food? Take the time to dehydrate things, take the time to grind things into powders and flowers and basically build our own indigenous pantry um, to make food taste exactly like like where we are, you know, and just using the world around us, you know, so when we're making foods, we're making things like here in Minnesota, we could be using wild rice, sunchoke, rose hips, blueberries, walleye, um, white cedar, balsam fir, things like that. And you can literally just stand in one spot and glance around and see all those ingredients right there, you know, because that the world around us can be our pantry. And we just try to showcase that. And as chefs, we can play around, we can make food look pretty and beautiful and tasty, of course, and maintain a lot of health involved. But really, we just try to keep this food simple. Oops, I already did that. And just, you know, just really try to make things, again, taste like where we are. We're not even trying to fusionize other indigenous cultures. We just really try to you know, focus on whatever region that we might be cooking in and, and cook with just what's there and keeping things really super simple. Um, because for us, we're just trying to get this food back into indigenous communities that need it the most, because we need to be eating healthy we need to have access to our own indigenous foods. Um, and we need to be able to do this on a massive scale. Um, Cause for so far too long, our indigenous communities have not had access to our own indigenous foods. And, you know, we can't general overgeneralize it. We really have to like to start to showcase and celebrate the diversities that are out there. So for us, like that's our main goal is trying to reclaim indigenous health and culture through food and using that language. So we've been able to start businesses. Our first food truck was called Tatanka truck, which we opened up in 2014 with or 2015 with the urban native community here in Minneapolis called Little, Little Earth of United Tribes and we created a menu around the work that we're doing so focused mainly on Dakota and Anishinaabe um, diets of uh, this Great Lake region that we happen to be in so lots of wild rice lots of native agriculture you know buying foods from indigenous um, farms using a lot of wild games so everything from turkey and duck to elk and, mo and moose and antelope and um, all sorts of lake fish because we are in Minnesota and there's just a ton of freshwater fish everywhere and you know there's no sodas there's no ketchups there's no any of that kind of stuff here like our main beverage was just cedar and maple tea um, and just showcasing that it can be done you know so when we started the sous chef it was all about that mentality of just trying to showcase um, uh, what is decolonizing our diets and what is moving forward with that and creating teams around that um, to be able to do lots of dinners and um, just giving a lot of opportunity towards a, more, a new generation of indigenous peoples. Um, and we also found it really important that we needed to really focus on the education educational aspect of things, which is why we created the nonprofit, which is Natives or North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems, which is a 501c3. And we've really focused on just, you know, trying to design this Indigenous culinary infrastructure with two main focuses. One of them is just creating access to Indigenous education. The other is creating access to Indigenous food. So it's basically just using what the U.S. government used against us by removing us from our education and removing us from our food and using those two fronts to push back to make a better world for the next generation. So a lot of this work is happening through Indigenous Food Lab, which is under the nonprofit, um, which is really focused on creating this. So 
we opened Indigenous Food Lab in 2020 during the pandemic here. We actually had found this perfect building and space and we moved in. We we're about ready to sign a lease um, early that year. And then the pandemic hit, hit in March. And then we just had to like just sit and wait. And we decided it was probably a really bad year to open up a restaurant that year. Um, and then right away in late May, the George Floyd um, murder happens just a few blocks from us in Minneapolis. And the street that we're on is the main street that um, got hit hard, the hardest with the social uprising. So all the buildings around our kitchen just got completely burned to the ground and our homeless uh, population exploded. So we started doing a lot of food relief. We were doing 400 meals a day um, during that pandemic, right in the middle of that pandemic and literally just taking food around to homeless encampments. And then as the winter came around, we started working with tribal communities across Minnesota and we were sending uh, food to nine out of 11 tribes across Minnesota and we're sending 10,000 healthy indigenous meals a week out of our kitchen back then. Um, and it's really just giving people the understanding of what uh, there are the benefits of an indigenous diet. You know, there's healthier fats, there's more uh, of diverse proteins, there's low carbs, low salts, a lot of an immense amount of plant diversity. Um, a lot of people, if you think about it, like have, have very little plant diversity in their diets, but indigenous peoples, because we were so resourceful with what the, with the world around us and had such intense knowledge and education about what to use and when to use and how to use and how to preserve, we just had so much plant diversity in our diet which is really, really good for us. Um, also understanding um, the importance of organic and indigenous focused agriculture and practices and celebrating cultural and regional diversities and just, you know, creating regional and seasonal based food systems in general and just, again, celebrating diversity when it comes down to it. So when we're looking at indigenous food sovereignty, you know, we need to be able to have access to healthy foods. We need cultural food producers and regional food systems. We need local control and non-governmental control of our food systems. We need access to our own indigenous focused education and we need environmental protections to be able to, you know, support the growth of a lot of the wild uh, plants that we utilize in our diets. Um, <clears throat> we really want to work directly with tribal communities. Um, we want to push for more community gardens. We want to push for more per permacultural land spaces because we should just be designing land space with the purpose of food everywhere. You know, lawns are stupid. We should just be putting food absolutely everywhere we can and creating systems and volunteer programs to be able to process a lot of that food and creating much needed pantry items that we could use to supplement a lot of the food needs and hunger needs that are out there. Um, and, you know, it's really, really important that we also put a lot of infrastructure and effort into training people professionally how to process a lot of these foods. So it's one thing to, you know, read about it or maybe pick some ramps in the spring, but like, how do you actually do this sustainably? How do you do it? Um, so you can create pantry items so you can utilize some of these things throughout the year. And it's going to be really important that we have a new generation of focused indigenous decolonized kitchens out there so people can harvest a lot of wild foods, bring them back to these kitchens, process them and preserve them for their own community because um, we just truly believe that if you can control your food you can control your destiny in real time so and we're just doing everything we can to really focus create focused curriculum and education um, we're about ready to open up a, a a class a community classroom here in, in Minnesota in Minneapolis where we can really start to um, offer a lot of the curriculum around these pieces around all these things um, on, a, on a regular basis so people have access to being able to come and and do and just have have access to this education in general um, our goal is to you know even though we're starting in Minnesota that our goal is to recreate indigenous food lab and open it up in cities all over the place because we can be all across the US and Seattle Denver, Albuquerque, Boston, Chicago, um, basically everywhere. And each one of these food labs becomes a regional center point for more access to education, um, entrepreneurial development, and also working directly with tribal communities and helping them to develop their own healthy food operations for their community, whether it's out of a community center or maybe they have a casino and they want to do something larger and do a full-scale restaurant in the style that we have done at Awamni in Minnesota. Um, <clears throat> We want to be able to see a lot more Indigenous food producers. Um, the tier that we use is that we try and purchase from local Indigenous um, uh, peoples first, and then we and then nationally. So we're able to buy a lot of Indigenous foods that we feature, um, and we just want to create more of that. We want to create more systems to develop that, and just see more and more Indigenous food businesses and food products out there on the market, and, and helping to create a demand. And Awami's been able to do just that. We've been extremely busy. We opened up in July last year. 
Um, we've gotten a lot of uh, accolades. Um, we've been on New York Times best restaurant list, um, Esquire Magazine's best restaurant list, Esquire Magazine named to me chef of the year this year. Uh, we have two James Beard nominations that we'll find out about in June, one for best restaurant, one for best chef um, of the region. And, you know, uh, we've been sold out every single night since we opened, which is great. But really the focus of this restaurant was just showcasing that a modern day indigenous decolonized restaurant can exist. And it's just a proof of concept that we're able to utilize for education and development for the rest of the work that we do. And just showcasing and celebrating land spaces of it from the indigenous perspective, you know, of where we may be. Um, um, and just being able to drive that demand so we can just use a ton of indigenous product as we're moving forward um, and just, you know, showcasing the amazing diversity that's out there within these indigenous food products and just applying a lot of creativity and creating a platform for a whole new generation of young indigenous or older indigenous chefs to be able to play and create all sorts of things. Because again, like, you know, cutting out dairy, cutting out flour, cutting out sugar, which is typical dessert, you know, we're able to do a lot. We're able to be extremely creative with what we have around us. Um, and for us, this is an indigenous evolution and revolution at pretty much the exact same time. Um, and we just really want to create a safe space again for indigenous people. So when we hired last year, we hired 80 people and 70% of our staff identified as indigenous, which is huge for a very uh, non-diverse city like Minneapolis. Um, and we just truly believe that the future is indigenous and everything that we're doing is for the next generations because we just want to set up everything we can so kids coming into this world will be able to know how to get their indigenous foods and where to get the, their indigenous foods and why their indigenous foods make them feel better than gas station foods or fast foods or just over processed foods in general all right so anyways that is um, a slightly sh shorter version of my presentation and i'm gonna switch back to my video. And I'm hoping that we might be able to have a small conversation in a little bit of time if anybody has any questions on any of that, because I know that's a lot of information in a quick time. <laughs> but I also wanted to just open up the floor a little bit to ch chit chat about some of that stuff, if you yeah. guys want. Nicole, was there any specific uh, questions from the audience? <clears throat> Not yet. So if you guys have questions, okay. please put them in the Q&A. Uh, I will ask them. Yeah, Sean, I had two particular questions. One is about um, and in, in Native American communities in the Southeast, we groom each other, not all of us, but some of us groom each other mm -hmm. to think that chicken CAFOs are a source of income and, and wealth and that we should kind of celebrate the corporatization of um, animal husbandry. So I want to get your thoughts on that. Speaking to people where I'm from who are Native and who really don't care that chicken CAFOs and different agricultural corporate realities are poisoning our peoples. Like, what is your take on that? Like, what is your, your statement? And then um, I think it's iron about the grass. I think it's ironic that the same companies that have taken over the agricultural kind of seed space are also the ones that actually get you to spray the, the herbicides on your grass and they yep. all sponsor baseball, which is not only uses native people as mascots, Right, they worship of grass. Absolutely. When, I, yeah, I, I don't I, want to put other. Yep. Well, I mean, I think when it comes to like you know, as indigenous communities, like we get to. Uh, we get to define what our own indigenous foods are for our own community. You know, we can stay in the vein of what we've done here at Awamni by just really kind of pushing towards decolonizing everything taking away colonial ingredients and really pushing back against the chicken, beef and pork, um, you know, industrial complexes and really focused on a lot more game and really like over half of our menu is plant-based when it comes down to it, especially since there's no dairy in it. Cause we just really believe in health. Like we just really want to put healthy foods in front of people. And we're not even calling ourselves a health food restaurant. It's just that our indigenous foods are so healthy and so clean. Like you just feel so good. So, but again, like, you know, we have groups like uh, there's going to be certain things that we can't take away from us as indigenous peoples, you know, coffee would be a good example where we can't lose coffee, even though it has a really awful colonized history. Um, you know, I grew up on Pine Ridge where we have horses and can't definitely can't take horses out of the Lakota. Um, they have the churro sheep and the Navajo, and you definitely can't separate that out either. So some things we grow into, you know, so some things we have from um, um, colonizers that become uh, woven into who we are as indigenous peoples. And again, like we can take the time to define whatever we want to. There's really no particular rules. Like we're just being role models of how we can go forward with really decolonizing on a, on a broader scale 
scale of things. You can always substitute out other proteins if you really wanted to do something a little bit different, you know. Um, but it's the more important part is like, are we able to purchase foods from indigenous peoples? Are we able to help support, um, you know, animal husbandry with indigenous peoples? You know, because I'd be happy to use beef if it's coming from a native ranch um, or situations like that. But we're still going to feature a lot of protein diversity when it comes out down to it. Um, so I don't know if that helps a little bit, but I think like it's, it's just conversations that we have to have and we're happy to help indigenous communities help them define. So if we're, like we're set up at indigenous food labs to help them develop entire like culinary programming for the community, you know, so they can work with us and we can decide what's important to them and what do they want to maintain as long as you're putting language into it and giving the opportunity for indigenous peoples to be a part of that. And, you know, getting, we just need to see more native food products out there on the market and just more opportunity. And like, we're helping to popularize it. So people want to see native foods and we should be able to see native restaurants in every single area of the United States, which we're not there yet. You know, there's very few indigenous restaurants out there at all, um, but we need to change that and we can mm -hmm. and what was and the second question sorry one more time. it really wasn't a question it was observation i love the fact you brought the grass so there's oh a, yeah, yeah that's right the <laughs> sense that as an anthropologist i say this there's a sense that we need to understand there's these really interesting corporate entities that want us to both devalue indigenizing seeds and, and agriculture in general but they also get us to kind of worship the grass in a stadium where the atlanta braves are tomahawk chopping so i just think the ironies are really thick right yeah, and I think it's, you know, uh, this this language of food and the work that I've fallen into and being, you know, as a chef, just being able to travel around the nation and visit tribes all over the place and really kind of get a feel for where people are at and just varying degrees of food sovereignty work and stuff like that. And just being able to, you know, take that temperature and just being able to give these presentations where we just deep dive straight into colonialism and give, them, give everybody that history of colonialism. And, you know, I talked a lot about the mascots and a lot of my former presentations too, because we should we need to be past that era you know we can't be lump summing all indigenous peoples into these icons um, and this these mascots because it's just so damaging you know and pushing back against things like the thanksgiving story of, particularly of course too which we've been able to do very effectively but using food as this main language to open up a lot of doors um, to be able to have these conversations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very good we have a few questions for you if you don't mind um, no i don't mind at all okay great so the first one is are there any indigenous restaurants in Wisconsin? And maybe we could also extend that to say, is there like a, a central place we can go to find if there's an indigenous restaurant in a local area? Well, you know, we're just about 40 minutes from the Wisconsin border at Awamni, so you can always just cross that colonial border and come visit us there. Um, there, we have been talking to some groups. There's some fun stuff going on at Ho with Ho Chunk Nation around Wisconsin Dells. I know that uh, we have we've done some things with Bad River Reservation um, in northern Wisconsin, um, and we're hoping that we can work. We've been, you know, really close with some of those tribes, and that we're hoping that we can do some good work. But we have talked about, you know, working with with the Bad River community or the Red Cliff community and helping to open up some kind of food thing. Red Cliff has a really great fishery. So there's a lot of great native fish being produced out of that reservation up north there too. So there's some cool stuff, you know, and like, you know, it depends on what part of the nation you're in, but there's like, there's, you know, there's always something, always something out there and there's always room for a lot more. The next question is, what do you think is a good way to educate the public on the history of indigenous people that you have highlighted? Do you have an opportunity to do this in your restaurant at all? You know, we're able to put a little bit of education out there. One example is that uh, when we, uh, we're, we're, we're basically a park restaurant. So the Minneapolis Park uh, owns the building and they built a brand new park around that building and we became the vendor for that particular building. Um, so when they were redoing everything, we had them landscape all indigenous plants back into the ground. And then we created little placards that shows the Dakota name of that plant and then the English name and then a description of how that plant can be used. So people can walk around that park and see this education right in front of them and look at those plants in real time. And a lot of those plants are actually flavors that we have in the restaurant particularly also, which is pretty cool. So there's a lot of opportunity for all sorts of education and hands-on and just like passive education like that particular piece out there. Um, but I think obviously, you know, there's such an interesting time in history where people are pushing back on uh, like teaching the true history of this, of this nation, you know, this nation is so like just, uh, 
obviously ashamed of its own history that now it's punishing people for teaching those histories. But as indigenous peoples, we should not tolerate it. Like we should just, everybody should know these stories. Everybody should know how colonialism affected us and is still affecting us. And it's still actually alive in places like Brazil, you know, where indigenous peoples are being murdered right now today for the resources that their land is on or under whatever. So there's just a lot that this history should be important. Um, I always tell people, you know, read um, Indigenous Peoples History of the United States, which is a really great documentation of a lot of the colonial history that happens and the formation of U.S. militarism that's still active today, obviously, um, and just having a better understanding of how things come to be, you know, and how the aggressiveness of the U.S. government, government against uh, Indigenous peoples has set the tone for what is still U.S. military today when it comes down to it. All right, our next question is, do you have any guidance for well-meaning white church ladies who want to be your allies? <laughs> what can they do to be most helpful to the cause of restoring access to indigenous foods? Is it to decolonize their own minds? I think it's, you know, um, looking for part of whatever part of the nation you might be in, but looking for some um, small groups of people trying to do some 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 community work. Maybe they're trying to do an indigenous community garden. Maybe they're setting up a nonprofit to focus on education, or maybe they're focused on diabetes prevention or whatever it might be, but trying to utilize food, but just like trying to figure out how can you support, you know, because a lot of us, especially coming from tribal communities, don't have a lot of resources. We don't have the rich uncles to be able to help us get loans to start businesses or purchase things to work, to work our way. So, you know, whether it's sharing GoFundMe projects or whatever it might be, but it's just being aware a little bit of what's out there and like how can you support um, whatever indigenous initiatives are happening in your own community and how can you help spread awareness to that um, and I think that's you know one way because like we um, when we had the sous chef uh, running for the longest time we were just renting a church kitchen you know <laughs> and that helped us immensely we were able to do a lot of business and hire a lot of young and native people um, and you know we we because we didn't have those kinds of resources we couldn't afford to build a commercial kitchen out from scratch you know and we did whatever we could to do our businesses so there's there's always something out there that people could be supportive of and this is our last question so um, they gave you a high five for the presentation and they wanted to know if there is a list online for food sovereignty farms well, there's a growing list out there because there's a lot of work with the NA NAAF grant, which is the Native American Agricultural Fund, um, groups like uh, the First, First Nations Development in Colorado, um, the IAC, which is the Intertribal Agricultural Council. Um, they really have their fingers on the bull, on on. on just of what's happening out there, you know, and there's summits happening. There's a big one here in Minnesota coming up in May called Seeds of Native Health, which brings in a lot of indigenous peoples from all over the place. Um, there's another food summit happening in Northern Michigan right before that one. Um, and there's just the various, you know, food sovereignty kind of events happening here and there that people should just really be aware of. And then um, we're working on our own website through Natives and through Indigenous Food Lab to be able to um, be a place where people can resource a lot of the education that we're creating through video work um, and and blog posts but also um, just connecting people with information about what's going on in their region you know like what kind of wild plants would you find in your region and access to researching more about those and native names tagged to those plants and where's the native farms and native seeds and native projects and we just want to be able to tie all that together so there could be a, a, a point for us to really steward this knowledge moving forward and, and make it accessible for people anytime they need it great Thank you so much for joining us today. It was very um, enlightening and um, some parts, you know, sad but true history that we, like you said, we have to deal with um, as a society. And, um, but again, we are resilient as natives and uh, we will push forward and, you know, hopefully bring about some of our um, traditional values along with this and to educate those non-natives who are willing to learn. So, Absolutely. Sean, if uh, if we're traveling up to uh, the northern Midwest, can we let y'all know we're coming? Maybe we'll come as a group. 
Absolutely. Yeah, reach out to us anytime. Uh, we have a nice conference room at Awamni. Um, we have our native, or we have the Indigenous Food Lab, so we're opening up a native market in just a few weeks, and we have our native classroom probably active um, very about the same time too. Um, we just have a lot of fun projects going on, you know. So come visit us. We have a lot of outdoor space that people can sit outside and try the restaurant um, and just kind of see what we're what we're offering. But we've been having a lot of fun. We've created a ton of recipes. We have a great staff, and we're really excited to just do what we do. We just put a lot of intention to the offerings at the restaurant, and even our wine list is almost entirely indigenous when it comes down to it so mm. just a lot of fun stuff interesting yeah thank you so much we appreciate it of course all right now we are going to make a small shift towards dana thompson I'm gonna, i want to put the uh, official powerpoint up one second <clears throat> All right, we have Dana Thompson, Chief Operating Officer, sous chef. Uh, so slightly related, right? And then the executive, executive Director for Natives. All right, Dana, it is all yours. Hello, um, thank you so much for having me uh, today. I am uh, unfortunately not sure exactly how long I'm gonna be talking. Um, my understanding was that I was going to be engaging with Sean, uh, answering some questions about the work that we do at Natives. And so I can just go off the cuff by myself or else I can bring Sean back on. Um, in, in any way, I mean, we can continue. We, you could sort of start a dialogue or we could ask you questions. It, it's up, up to you totally. Okay, great. Well, um, yeah, I'd love it if, if, if Sean and I could talk a little bit too and you certainly could ask questions, but just to start, I would um, just like to say that um, Sean and I have been running the, the company, The Sous Chef, for over seven years now. And we have uh, made a lot of progress, as you have heard in the presentation. And um, we were able to open the nonprofit a few years ago and immediately get sort of mowed down by the pandemic. And um, and then simultaneously, of course, the uprising, and we're located on historic Lake Street, as I'm sure he, he told you. And uh, in spite of all that, we have shown that wonderful Indigenous resiliency and, um, and really pivoted to create a lot of really fun programs that we are excited to share with the world. And um, as executive director of the nonprofit and founder, it's just been an extraordinary pleasure for me. I just have to say how humbled I am to be in this position right now. Um, I never thought that I would be in this position for longer than six months, but uh, it's just been amazing to lead a team and to build a team. This last six weeks, we've brought on a new team member every week. And the onboarding process for that to bring in all of these incredible indigenous people with brilliant minds and with their own histories has been just the privilege of a lifetime. And um, I'm so grateful that we have all of these brilliant thinkers to share this with. And they have been saying to, to Sean and I, you know, you guys have been working hard. You know, we see everything that you've been doing now, um, you know, set the vision into our capable hands and, and let us take the ball and run with it. And, and they're willing and able and brilliant. And we're so excited about that. Uh, it's segmented off into three sections uh, for the nonprofit. And we've got the education team, which is creating a lot of different types of um, videos and uh, different types of collateral as far as um, cookbooks and pamphlets and different things that we can engage with the community with that they're gonna be posting up on the website soon, as well as um, these kind of Zoom classes and other types of classes. And, um, and then we've got the culinary side, um, which is incredible. And we've been setting up all sorts of fun projects, so many different types of uh, programs with um, WIC, with the USDA, with um, the Department of, of Health and Human Services um, and clients like that. And then um, we've got the project management team that is managing so many different types of projects. Uh, it's a little overwhelming to talk about and we, we can't possibly say yes to everything. So we have to think really carefully about the partners that we do take on. 
um, because simultaneously with all this, we're opening up our first market that I'm sure Sean told you about, but our first Indigenous food market is going to not only uh, be able to have um, bulk Indigenous foods, but we want to be a uh, uh, a person or a, a, an organization that drives wealth back into tribal communities by purchasing from any indigenous vendor so that we have all of that in one place so that people can walk through and really touch and smell and feel and um, ask questions with our staff and understand all of the things that we have there and the histories and the stories of how they were produced or foraged or, or however they were uh, they, they were um, put into packaged form that we're able to to sell. And um, if we can keep purchasing from those those producers, then um, you know we hope that they'll just continue to thrive. So um, it's just been incredible. And with the sous chef, you know, Awamni was I I hesitate to say this, but it was it was almost an afterthought. <laughs> we we didn't really intend to open the 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 what arguably is um, the most talked about restaurant in the United States, if not the world right now. And, um, but we're so grateful that we did. Our staff is incredible. Our, the food is, is wonderful. Um, people are literally weeping into their plates uh, every night of the week. Uh, people fly in from a different state or country several times a week. And, um, you know, we, we haven't been able to uh, serve the whole community because the reservations have just been full the entire time. Um, you know, but beyond that, um, Sean and I still do, you know, these kind of speaking engagements and this kind of community engagement where we'll travel to different communities. I was just out um, working with the Wabanaki in Maine, uh, just got back last night. Sean was working with the tribal communities down in the Nayarit coast of Mexico, um, just got back last night. And, um, and then we have all sorts of different things with Sean working on his next book. I'm working on a book. Um, we have possible TV in our future. Uh, we do all sorts of different types of um, consulting and uh, uh, engaging with the, with the tribal communities in a lot of different ways. And not only the tribal communities, but I'm really passionate as a lactation consultant of working with the WIC program and really educating about the first food, the first indigenous food. Um, that's really important to me and um, and my work within the uh, science of epigenetics. So I've got several different groups of epigenetic scientists at different universities across the country that um, I'm engaging with on a regular basis to find out about how ancestral trauma is passed through generations. And uh, this is only 25 year old research. And so for us to react to each other and um, for us to, to talk to all of our partners about how that's manifesting has been really, really incredible. And um, there's so much more research to do. I'm very, very passionate about how these ancestral foods, not just eating them, but um, growing them, gathering them, working with the seeds, um, digging your hands in the soil, getting out into the forest, or um, just interacting with your community and feeding your community is a, a healer for ancestral trauma and tra trauma in any way. And um, I believe very deeply that, that we can make an impact on the mental health of Indigenous peoples um, with this information. So those are the big the big things that that I'm really focused on, um, but I would be happy to to go back and forth with Sean or answer questions. Hey Nicole, let's uh, look for look for questions in the Q and A. Um, but I do have some questions. I thank you for opening <laughs> the floor for the number, <laughs> right? Because as an anthropologist, as an anthropologist of race and Native America, like this is this is the space that I work in. I actually recorded a video or documentary with Mercy for Animals which was uh, centered on chicken CAFOs in the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina, where the ninth oh. largest American Indian community uh, in the United States, largest east of the Mississippi. And literally the state of North Carolina and the federal government has pushed corporate chicken farming and hog farming before that into our community. So you're using these images of native people with their hands in the soil, right? Uh, intergenerational trauma healing that can be kind of, the healing that can be created out of that, right? And, you know, I'm sitting here having conversations with my niece about, you know, her inability to go to school without smelling waste in the air, mm. you know, from these chicken farms, right? And, and, and literally, we're trying to educate our own people. Listen, we don't have to deal with this. 
you know, if you would push, if you would fight collectively, right? But at the same time, there's this idea that, you know, this is America. This is how money is made. This is the smell of money, if you will, right? right. Um, so I want to put that on your plate. Uh, maybe it can just kind of resonate there and we can kind of pick it apart. The other thing I was thinking about was, I don't know if you're going to do anything with the Food Network, hopefully. Um, uh, but this the Pioneer Woman, I believe is her name. You know, every time I see her, I think that's her name, if I'm not mistaken. Every time I see her and her show on TV, you know, I think I've tweeted at them a few times. Like, why can't we have the indigenous woman, you know, um, cooking on TV, you know, doing things to recreate the American cuisine. And I know, though, as an anthropologist and as a Native person, having our presences on TV, changing culinary taste is literally challenging America, you uh -huh. know, because America was formed against everything we love, taste, sense, right? Yeah. So if we could let that sit and stew a little bit, I, you know, I, I, I think there's a conversation there about what you, you all are brilliant. What you're doing is brilliant, you know, but when you begin placing your restaurant in Florida, in Texas, yeah. in California, right? Mm -hmm. When you begin to kind of insert into what shall we call it, the colonial kind of multi palated you know, food industrial complex, when right. you begin to insert yourself into those areas, you know, what does that mean? You know, I, I don't know there's a lot of questions there, a lot of conversation. But I want to put it on your plate. Yeah, absolutely. I, it, you're you're 100 right, and it's it's an absolute opportunity for um, what I call passive education, where people don't even know that they are learning. A different culture that that what we are doing is an act of resistance itself the fact that we managed to survive for seven years and are thriving in going into our eighth year of operations um, with all of what we're doing the plates in the air are spinning all the time for us because there's so much work um, i say to sean all the time that we have a half a, lot, a half of a lifetime left to set up just the foundational elements for what will be multiple lifetimes worth of work and um, my background is in branding and marketing and um, project managing and talent um, management and all of that stuff. And so what the way I see it is that we're presenting all of these indigenous flavors, this indigenous imagery, indigenous faces, um, all of this beauty of the culture in front of people, but we're not hitting them over the head with it. We're putting it in front of them, and then they learn from from just their own experience that this is so beautiful. The indigenous wisdom, oh, duh! Like we shouldn't we shouldn't have destroyed the beautiful falls outside of Owamni. You know, we they go there and they learn that there was a beautiful horseshoe of waterfalls that was there that was as beautiful. It was reported on by the the first explorers that it was as striking as Niagara Falls. And what did capitalism do? What did, um, you know, colonialism do immediately? Destroyed them all. Created skirting and a series of drills that went through and basically collapsed the entire thing. And it's so short-sighted. They did it so that there was a lock and dam there for their shipping. And the lap, like, lock and dam is now defunct. It doesn't work at all. It's just a huge pile of... Um, cement <laughs> and so we are able in our situation to have that conversation with people that just come in off the street oh are you guys a restaurant what are you doing here okay well here's what we're doing and here's the menu we don't have to tell them even they can read it they can say oh what is this word i don't recognize this at all it's the dakota word for bison Okay, so why does you have a Dakota word for bison? And then you, our staff is trained to have these conversations with people in a really light, beautiful way. And then the people walk out the door so much more educated than they were when they walked in. And if we're able, or if, or if uh, the people that come through our program or any Indigenous person is inspired to open a restaurant in any other area, it's about the history of that tribe. And every single area in this country is an opportunity for this incredible wealth of education. And that's what excites me. I can't wait to see what other people do with, with um, any of the resources that either we're able to, uh, to, to offer them or, or, or if they can get that from somewhere else. You know, we're hopefully not the only place in the country that's able to offer these types of resources. But we, what we are intending to do is find out 
um, from anyone that has an interest in entrepreneurship, what do they want to do? And if there are barriers to their success, we will work to eliminate them. If, if they need a logo, if they need um, equipment, if they need our team to come through and take a look at their menu and try to figure out what it is that they need to do, if they need help um, uh, figuring out how to have a credit score or talk to a bank, how do they get financing? Absolutely any, any possible barrier, we are gonna have resources to, to assist. And it's that's not, what the goal is. It sounds like the, it sounds like Shark Tank, but indigenous. <laughs> Except for we're not gonna yell at anyone. Right. I've, I've, always, I've always wanted to know like, what would the Shark Tank look like with indigenous people? So if anybody in the media understands, you know, you know what it means to place indigenous people on Shark Tank. Maybe we should test that out because I, I believe what you're saying is literally this isn't this isn't a continuation of capitalism as we've known it as an American project. This is a continuation, which some native native people use the term capitalism. They say yes, we make in wealth and we have savings and things like that. But um, this is really about indigenous people saying, "Hey, we're going to begin to restore, heal, uh, you know." Seal, seal, seal the Gulf, if you will, but then build bridges over into our own communities, right? We need to learn about each other. I actually have this interesting idea. Native people start need to start visiting one another more, you know, visiting <laughs> communities, not, not in a touristy way, just to share stuff. But then, you exactly. know, but building bridges also into the colonial society, which we're part of in some yep. ways, and we enjoy some aspects of it. And then into the world, um, because, you know, I find that when I talk to European folks and they're asking, like, what are Native people doing today? You know, like, it's like, do you start with the trauma or do you start with, wow, we have gifts to give to the world now and I can share them with you. Uh, and it's really difficult. But, you know, you're, you, you all as an organization seem to be really propelling this idea of, as you suggest, um, not knocking them over the head, but offering a bridge into indigenous knowledge, which is, you know, when people figure it out, it's like, aha, we shouldn't have, you know, left this or, uh, you know, abandoned it or destroyed it, you know, before, but now we'll embrace it. Definitely. Right, right, right. Absolutely. And it's about, um, you know, having the ability to, um, to, to, I think, I, I, I honestly think that, that one of the most important things that I want to see happen is that we do education about the um, scarcity mindset versus the abundance mindset. Mm. Can you stay, stay, yeah, stay there for a second, explain that. So the, so the scarcity mindset uh, is a natural human response when you have um, come through oppression or abuse or trauma and not just trauma that has happened to you in your own life, but epigenetic trauma, trauma that you've inherited from your ancestors. It's something about the way your neural pathways are built as a protective mechanism. And what it does is if uh, the, it's like an automatic response that's unconscious. So if somebody like say, for instance, um, someone in an inner city, Chicago, very poor neighborhood grows up and does well in school, and is able to get a full scholarship and goes to medical school and comes back. Then when they come back to, to their neighborhood, everyone sort of rejects them because they got it. So they, so the people, this person got it. So everyone else in the community didn't get it. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's just an automatic response. And so you have to learn the mindset of abundance. And the mindset of abundance is that if someone else got it, then you also, they can be a model for you, you know, or they can help you or, or they're going to help our community. And that's going to help the ripple effect is just impossible to even quantify. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's really the true, the true way it works. Yeah. You're speaking across several different realms of, of native, um, how should I say it, community building. Uh, one of the things that Nicole and I talk about a lot is the idea of mentorship. Mm -hmm. native, native people oftentimes, and you can look into different Native communities, there's a sense that, that Native people feel like oftentimes when we get into a certain position, we really have to defend it, right? And defending it is part of that scarcity, you know, mindset. Yep. And it really blocks the mentorship that really should play out. Once we're in a certain position, we really should start gifting people with our knowledge and insight and building infrastructure that really, you know, does the building that we envision as Native people needs to be done in a decolonial way. But oftentimes, 
in our personal settings, we kind of help stymie it. Um, you know, and it's hard for us to say that because Native people, you know, we want to say, you know, you know, we've, we've as a community suffered across the board. Uh, but I believe focusing in on the idea of mentorship, but more generally, like, as you say, building and understanding that we can be mentors to each other and we can really begin to grow infrastructure mm -hmm. and spaces, you know, and I believe the language revitalization movement across the United States, and, our, and there's interesting work happening by MIT alum, where they're using artificial intelligence to build language. Uh, in, in Lakota community, I believe is one of the areas uh, communities and nations. And there's a couple other tribal nations where, you know, they're really saying, listen, we know science and technology was formed against us. It wanted to destroy us in the late 1800s. But now we're using the skills that we have through colonial education to really begin to gift other communities and allow them to prosper and build and, and be wealthy, if you will, in right. this case, in knowledge and uh, language. But yes, what you're, what you're hitting on is I think it, it ties into a lot of areas of community building in Native America. Absolutely. And, you know, and we are operating in a capitalist environment. We, there's no way around it. And we just, we have to adapt. And, um, you know, uh, my grandfather was um, Dakota, um, uh, Wapitan Sisseton and Midwakatan Dakota. And, you know, I heard stories about how his community members um, kind of bonded together and shared information to help build each other up. And I heard that it was really unusual. And Sean and I both have um, ancestors that went to the Carlisle Indian School and other boarding schools as well. And coming out of that, it seemed like that scarcity mindset was really built in into those communities uh, because of that um, corporal punishment. And it, it's 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 really important that we have awareness about it because there's no changing it if you can't name it. It's the one rule of changing your own mental health and your own perspective, because all you have to do is notice, name it, and that's the first step onto the healing path. Mm, mm, mm. Nicole, do we have any questions from the uh, Q&A? We do. We have a question, and I wanted to add to that. Um, as we were reflecting from our conference on Monday, um, David and I were talking about oftentimes when you do leave your community to get an education or to pursue an opportunity, um, you know, you come back and, and you're not accepted because you've assimilated too much or you're seen to have, to have assimilated too much. Um, and, you know, sometimes that deters members from leaving the community um, to, to gain that education with the hopes of coming back to, to help their community. Um, and then we also were discussing how oftentimes, you know, a lot is happening around our community. For example, like he was saying, you know, the cave was back at home in North Carolina. And a lot of our community members just feel like I just need the job. I need to support my family and provide for my family. And this is a, you know, a way to do that. And so it's kind of like, just put your head down and you're in survival mode and just keep going. Um, because that's your, you feel like that's your only option at the moment anyway. Right, absolutely. Yeah, and, and it's about surviving. So the question we have is, do you have any thoughts about thinking of campus chapters or partnerships for research, training, or just dining? Oh my goodness. So there's so much of opportunity for research. Um, we. Uh, through the nonprofit are creating a database of native knowledge. And we're just at the very, very beginning. And I see Sean is back. Sean, just feel totally welcome to jump in at any time if, if you want to add insight. Um, For sure. Just let me know. I'm happy to answer part of that question. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about just um, the different types of plant knowledge, um, uh, uh, landscape knowledge and understanding about Native culture, especially that we're focusing on. Um, and also um, we're starting to get into the uh, animals that we've hunt, hunted and fished traditionally. And um, there's just, it's going to be, it's going to be decades and decades of research that we have to do. And that's, that's really exciting. And I believe that um, as far as the menu goes, 
um, there's going to be a, a natural progression of how it's going to flow year after year. Every time we, we change a season, uh, we're going to have a different uh, team of chefs there that's going to add insight and have, have their own experience of to draw on. And they're going to want to experiment with different specials and different types of things. And I think that that's going to keep adding insight to how the nonprofit um, works as well, because we get the nonprofit team through, through the restaurant regularly to dine and to um, taste the flavors. And we, you know, we have a new um, culinary program director at the Indigenous Food Lab, this incredible Anishinaabe woman who, um, has years and years, decades of, of chef ex experience. And she came through Awamni uh, last week and um, immediately started texting me just these emotional texts. And she's like, I need to get you on the phone tomorrow. And so we got on the phone and she was weeping with the understanding of that um, she was able to taste these flavors that she had never really tasted before and understanding that the challenge, the discipline that it takes to remove all of these colonial ingredients and create this world-class plate of food. And, um, and I think that uh, it's just gonna continue to evolve and inspire people. But Sean, please add, add to that as well. Yeah, um, we've been able to work with a lot of higher education uh, facilities and have done uh, multiple talks over the years in just different regions with just, you know, so many different uh, campuses out there. And part of the work that we're doing with Natives and Indigenous Food Lab, um, we want to do the same thing with um, try, with with campuses, with, um, with uh, colleges and universities, because we could help those campuses develop um, Indigenous culinary into their own culinary operations for their faculty and for their student body, um, and just to help normalize Indigenous foods on a normal basis. So it doesn't just, doesn't just come around like when it's Native American month or Thanksgiving or something like that, but to normalize it a little bit more to really focus and feature some indigenous food products of those regions, especially working with some of the um, student groups and some of the classes that are out there that might be focused on these very particular pieces. But also we really want to work um, alongside professors and student groups to take on joint research and development projects. Um, so we could utilize some of our resources of where we are, some of our networks of uh, some places around, but also use some of the focus and resources of those universities to help tackle a lot of um, curriculum development and a lot of um, just, you know, just exploring whatever research and development projects we might be working on at the time. I just think there's a lot of opportunity to do that because we just really want to create a safe place to steward Indigenous knowledge for future generations um, and store that on our website so people have access to it um, and just use our, and create ourselves to be a resource for, for people everywhere, whatever age range, to tap into um, these Indigenous knowledge databases. Um, and we just feel like it would be so great to be able to do that alongside students um, uh, out there who are working kind of in this realm because we're seeing more and more classes on Indigenous Indigenous food sovereignty starting to pop up around different regions. We have a really good relationship with people um, like in Montana State and Bozeman. Um, we've worked with, um, you know, people. Uh, we have a really we have close network to people in Berkeley. We've got people in Southern California, um, Pembroke, all over the North Carolina. Yeah, we've been we've been kind of all over the place. So we really want to make that happen. Did you say Pembroke? Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I think, that's I think, our home community. <laughs> yeah, that's where that's well near. Where, I'm not. I'm not from Pembroke. I'm from Eastern Robinson County. But okay. but that is that is, that is that is <laughs> that is the epicenter of this tension, political tension in Native America over which way do we go? Really? Like, do we defend? Do we protect? Do we groom who we are in our food ways, or do we just just give in to you know just let anything ride? Hmm. And, so it's interesting you're working down there. That's interesting. Yeah. And uh, we have in the past, and a lot of us just like, you know, some of the places where we've done talks and where we've done some right. demonstrations and some meals and things like that, but we've created networks all over the place and we will continue. But also now that our nonprofit is up and running and we have, we have staffing moving forward and we're just trying to figure out like, how do we tie that together? Cause we're looking at possibly opening up an indigenous food lab extension in, in uh, Bozeman right now. So there's just a lot of cool stuff happening up there in Montana. We're doing the same thing with kind of exploring what would a food lab look like in Anchorage, Alaska 
Alaska and also down in Rapid City, South Dakota as possibilities. But eventually we're going to start stamping these out as fast as we can. We're going to need to find partners and places to put these on the east and southeast and, you know, basically everywhere. Um, but there's just so much opportunity for us to work alongside research and development teams, especially students and professors, to tackle a whole bunch of cool stuff. So I want to put this out there. I don't think you were here for my earlier presentation, but uh, my work at MIT deals with our third president, Francis Walker, who was basically the person who set up the reservation economic, the, econ the economics of the reservation system. And he was actually had his fingers. He was, he was a statistician. He set up the commodity system, which now we kind of know as the USDA commodity system that creates commod bods or whatever other subject. Yeah. You want to <laughs> So, so I, I here at MIT, I think there's a really interesting opportunity to get MIT to really say, okay, this is our legacy, this creation of anti-indigenous foodways. Could we help propel, you know, the creation of these foodways, uh, these yeah. indigenous foodways, or the revitalization of them? But also, and I like the whole idea of a food lab, right? Mm -hmm. This kind of concept of food lab that really takes MIT's resources and really pours them into the, re the creation of these spaces. Yeah, I mean, there's so much, because colleges have so much resources, you know, and especially if they have a little bit of land access, somebody's asking about the land grant, which, you know, land, our land grant uh, universities and colleges, um, but there's a lot of really interesting history there. People really dig into that whole story <laughs> too, but yeah, it would be great if we could work alongside and use some of those resources um, and use some of these, those pieces, because there's just so much, because we could be focused on uh, permacultural designs of different regions and agriculture and promoting and saving these seeds and teaching a new generation of indigenous farming techniques and pieces like that and then health and culinary you know it's such a huge part of it the preservation of our foods and creation of medicines and all those things too there's just so much that tags along to all the stuff we can be doing mm, this is good are there yeah. any more questions oh go ahead i'm sorry oh i just want to mention about that um question about access to capital and um that's one of the things that that i've been really passionate about recently and trying to figure out how we can how we can help um in so many different ways on all the different levels of of creating a, the possibility for anyone that needs um, money to get going because we don't want to just give a, a pile of money to someone and 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 then it just doesn't go anywhere if they don't have the ability to understand how to um, manage their money. Um, you know how how a credit score works. All of the all of the different things I was talking about. How to talk to a bank. How to get yourself set up with a bookkeeper. And all of these ways that we have to operate in a capitalist society. And so. Um, it's just really important that we talk about that. And Sean and I, I don't know if he mentioned about um, how difficult it was for us to get financing during during a pandemic as a restaurant, but it was almost impossible from the banking system. And so we wound up having to go through um, a, a network that focuses on social entrepreneurs. And so if you're making an impact in your community, if you're doing something related to culture, then um, you can have access to capital through a network where uh, philanthropists or um, uh, angel investors can put this money into a, a, an organization that kind of manages it and chooses the people that they're going to fund and so that they are able to vet them and make sure that they understand um, that they need a business plan and go through all of the different hoops that you need to do in order to, to be successful as a business person. And then they, they grant them that money and work with them really in a really flexible way about how it's going to get paid back. And so I think it's all part of that infrastructure of sending people up to succeed. That's really, really great. And yeah, I think there's resources out there that, you know, a lot of natives just don't know about. And so some of these dreams just kind of get squashed before they get started. Yeah, yeah. I do have a question. So I know that you guys are doing a lot and you've got the new restaurant and but have you guys thought about um, like a weekly meal program where you can send the foods out to um, <laughs> and, and we have. do them? Because <laughs> that would be nice, especially for you know people who don't live near a restaurant. Well, for our for, <laughs> for us natives in Boston. <laughs> I just flew back from Boston last night. Oh, um, we just missed you. I'm so sorry. We would have taken you out. <laughs> Darn it. Next time. I'll be back soon. Yeah, it was a very, very good trip. 
And during the pandemic, we actually did do um, some, some home meal kits. So we set up a recipe and all the ingredients needed so you can make a dinner for four um, out of those meal kits using these indigenous ingredients, you know, and um, we're still kind of playing around with how that might work in the future. But if we were able to have resources and have other indigenous food labs that could do some more of that community work can just have that out there. Um, and we've already, we've already published two small cookbooks through the indigenous food lab, highlighting some of the work that we do. Um, and, but yeah, again, like we would love to work with the, the university campuses and help them to do this on their own too, and just create, you know, even if there's a culinary track program to really focus on indigenous foodways and cooking and health and maintaining health through those situations. Um, cause we just really need to, you know, food is such a central part of indigenous education. Cause it's like what we all had to do as a community to survive. You know, when you break down what is an indigenous food system, it's a community-based food system that utilized all of that community support to help help grow, preserve, and create um, just pantry access and medicinal access, you know, processing all of that stuff, you know? There's so much education involved with that. I just wanna encourage uh, any attendees to please put your question in the um, Q&A box if you have any. Um, but yeah, this is definitely, you know, I know like just from my personal experience going through a lot of health issues that, you know, seem to be linked genetically, you know, and having to change my own diet. And it, and it was just such a struggle. And, and even though like as a kid, you know, I um, I didn't have the common diet of most kids in my community just because I had been diagnosed with high cholesterol at such a young age. Um, but, um, you know, through the years, it's just been a struggle to um, find food that, you know, my body can process and I can eat. And um, California is probably the best place that I lived um, to be able to have access to food that I needed and um, also that it be affordable. So that's the other challenge. I think, you know, um, natives who are have, dealing with these healthcare issues um, and having to change their diets. And um, we also need something that's affordable. Right. Yeah, it's really, it's really, um, it's really a challenge. And we encourage people to, to get to know the plants around them um, so that they can increase their micronutrients and get nutrient dense foods into their diets as much as possible. And of course, having, having a community garden or something is a lot of work, but it, it certainly helps. Um, but, you know, we've got a lot of work to do and um, we all need to work together as a team, everyone on this call and, and every, everyone we know to try to figure out ways to make that possible because it's, it's just um, a massive problem. I've, I've learned that um, the dried foods are really, really great to have in our diet. I was educated by our friend Valerie Seagrest out in Salish territory, who is a PhD um, holistic doctor um, to, to be able to get things that are great for my body. So as a woman, especially nettles is a really profound, profound plant and I can get it in bulk dried and I can make an infusion every single week, which I have on the stove right now. And then I drink that as my multivitamin first thing in the morning. <laughs> And it adds to that and it's not expensive and it's very easy to make. And so I think if we can just start layering in these nutrient dense foods um, bit by bit, uh, we're going to, we're going to get there. And, um, you know, I, I feel like through the indigenous food lab, it might be a really good idea for us to create some videos that are exactly like what you're talking about. I mean, Nicole, that is just such a brilliant idea for us to really break it down, like make a trip through the grocery store, <laughs> have, have our film crew follow someone through a grocery store and teach them like how you stay on the perimeter. You don't go into the center. <laughs> you shop the perimeter of that store and that's all you do. And, um, there's just little, little, you know, screw turn at a time, I think, to get us moving in the right direction. And then getting these healthy foods into the mouths of children at, at as early age as possible, starting with breastfeeding is absolutely critical. Definitely. So I don't see any questions, um, but this has been wonderful. Um, you know, conversation. And I think, you know, with the presentation that Sean gave us earlier, we've, we've all probably learned a lot um, and are very thankful that things are returning back to our, um, our culture and where we're from and, 
you know, appreciating that. And like we talked about earlier today, you know, walking into the room with your head held high and walking in as a native and, and honoring um, your culture. So, so, and, you know, health is wealth. And I, and I think that, you know, food goes along with that so much. And, um, and we, we need to be cognizant of, of what we are putting in our bodies and, and what we are recommending, especially to our youth. Um, you know, I, my background is I did go to med school. And so we did take nutrition classes. Um, but the last two years I was working as a seventh and eighth grade science teacher back in my home community. And the first day I was so shocked what um, they had for lunch. It was all carbs. And in med school, you know, we we're taught that they are getting a balanced lunch. Um, due to Michelle Obama's initiative. However, that was not the case that what I actually saw in the, in the lunchroom. And then to see that a lot of kids were throwing food, they would literally pick up the plate and take it straight to the trash can mm. um, because they were required to, you know, to get the plate of food. And so I, I was astonished at like, you know, all this food that was just in the trash can um, and that no one was eating. And so I think, you know, we have to get back to, to what it means to also not waste. Like, you know, Sean was saying earlier, we didn't, our ancestors didn't waste out of necessity and, and, you know, our youth also need to understand um, reasons against um, not, you know, wasting. So. Absolutely. And, I, and actually when, uh, I moved to the Lumbee community in 1991. Um, thinking back, like hearing Nicole's conversation and thinking back on 1991, there were much, I, I think the, the, what you found in the cafeteria back then was much more indigenous. You had Lumbee, went for the women for the most part, helping to generate whatever the menu was going to be. And so now that I think about it, you, you had, even though they weren't always the healthiest, recipes <laughs> that were coming from the community where we were at, local ingredients, um, and I like concepts for cooking that were local, right, indigenous uh, to the Lumbee community. And so, you know, we've we've gone a like a, you know a thousand miles away from what we experienced there in the early 1900s, uh, 1900s, 1990s. So yeah, so what we're sitting here doing is talking to young teachers, young principals who have never thought about these things. They just, you know, they, they don't, they aren't committed to helping make sure their local school environment is the healthiest, the wealthiest, you know, just the best. So. Mm -hmm. Well, to, uh, to add to that, a lot of them are on survival mode. You know, there's so Two many point, things right? yeah. moving with uh, little resources. And so it's like, okay, I, at least I could check the box that I fed them today. I fed them something today. Um, and the pandemic, I think, made that situation harder because of um, supply issues. And so, you know, kids were getting um, nothing close to anything that was balanced. It literally was whatever was able to, that was in the freezer that they could, you know, pass out to say we gave them at least three items today mm -hmm. and a carton of milk. So, yeah. right, right. Yeah, there's a lot of work to do. There's no doubt. <laughs> Yeah, but thank you all. You all are inspiring, obviously. I mean, we invited you here because you are. Um, but more than that, I'm hoping that uh, the folks who've listened this last couple of days, um, and that I think we're recording this, so they'll be somewhere public eventually, um, that what they get out of these conversations is a, is a mandate, is permission uh, to go forward and really begin to recreate what's around them. Um, you know, it's just, it's going to take people who are willing to just, as you call it a food lab, right, to, to be in that laboratory and begin to put hand to ingredient, mind and heart all together and begin to really create, so. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're super humbled um, at what we've done. Um, Sean and I are always amazed every single day we high five and can't believe that, that we're able to, to do this work. I wake up every single day grateful that I have uh, the best job in the world and there's just a, a fire hose of opportunities to to do every single day so thank you so much for seeing that and for having us absolutely absolutely all right well thank you all for joining us whoever I think we have 26 attendees left uh, plus the panelists thank you all for joining us um, 
We want to thank Sue Chef, Natives, uh, Sean, um, Dana. I, I mean, your work, your words have been really, really powerful. So thank you for really pushing us into this this next level. But all of our speakers today, thank you for all your input and and your advice and your 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 hope that you've given us. So 